morning. Mr. Ghosh, before. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, I apologise. Um, before you begin, Mr. Ghosh, um, my lady yesterday raised with you uh, the issues that were um, being ventilated in the FTT. And in light of that discussion, uh, the court would very much like to see um, HMRC's acknowledgement of service and summary grounds filed in the JR. Um, we had thought we'd like to see the statement of case in the FTT. Um, if that's available, that it, we would like to see that, but we're not as troubled by that um, at this stage. Uh, please, may I just arrange that? Yes, of course. I'm not expecting you to produce it immediately, but at some point. Uh, yes, certainly. Very helpful. And uh, I, uh, I had planned uh, to show the court uh, passages uh, in the FTT judgment, yes. which shows that, as it happens, uh, questions of why uh, Mr. Archer didn't, didn't pay were ventilated. Yeah. They, were, they were indeed. Uh, but, um, uh, well, first, good morning. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, please, may I, I start by uh, tying together what I said yesterday uh, that will frame. Uh, what I want to say about the material. Um, and please, may I start by saying this? Sorry, one, one other thing I should have said, and I apologise. I hadn't appreciated that we had a, a transcriber. Sometimes transcribers need a short break, um, and we didn't give any short breaks yesterday in the course of the morning or the afternoon. I'm not sure if that's something that would be welcome. It would be welcomed. All right. So, at, at, at somewhere around ten to twelve. Certainly. Thank you. And if, if I forget, of course, the court should remind me, and I'll I'll stop. Yes. Yes. Um, please, uh, uh, may I start by saying um, and saying this: uh, the narrative of this case is that um, the revenue saved, and, and they were right. Uh, that Mr. Archer's self-assessment had been amended. He said it had been amended either because the closure notices had done the job of themselves, and they were, they were wrong about that, or they were cured by Section 114, and they were right about that. Either way, there was a, a fight to be had, because Mr. Archer disagreed. And the question for, for this court in these proceedings was in the light of the revenue saying we have amended, in our view, your self-assessment, do you have a reasonable <coughs> excuse for not paying the tax? Whichever forum that dispute is resolved in, whether if you'd appealed in the FTT, or uh, in these collateral proceedings in the um, in bankruptcy. Um, I had understood the JR. We've talked about it as the bankruptcy JR because that was obviously the underpinning, particularly when it came to interim relief, was the threat of, of, of bankruptcy. But the point that was being made by Mr. Archer was that he didn't have to pay the twenty-two million at all because he thought the closure notice was effective and that you were out of time to amend it and that as look that there was no mechanism to amend it short of section 114 on which you lost um, well that's one way of putting it but that's the case of every taxpayer whether they're running a substantive point or what you might call a procedural point they're saying one way or another I don't owe you the tax either because the revenue has misunderstood or misapplied the substantive tax provisions or here you have misunderstood what Section 28A does, or what Section 114 does. Mm -hmm. So that, that's right, my lady, um, that there's a dispute as to whether any money should, 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 should be payable in tax at all. Yes. Uh, and, I'm, uh, and the question, though, is still in both cases, in the light of um, what I call the, the, the default position, that where there's been an amendment or a disputed amendment, which turns out to be a good amendment, 
59B says, if there's uh, 59B little 5 says, if you haven't appealed the closure notice, mm. that's where she pay. And if you don't pay, there's a surcharge. And there's only no surcharge if there was a reasonable excuse for not paying. Mm -hmm. And equally, <coughs> if you do appeal, um, default position is that you pay, subject to postponement. We went through that. And, uh, exactly. Uh, um, but not if it's an APN case. No. And in any event, you lose that if you lose in first year tribunal. But in both cases, the question is, um, uh, do you have a reasonable excuse for not yeah. paying the tax so as not to attract the surcharge? Whichever forum and whatever kind of dispute the taxpayer is having with the revenue officer. That, I think, is a fair way to put this que what, what this case is about. That comes anything more than just saying this case is about whether there was a reasonable excuse or not. That's what I say in my skeleton. Yeah. Yeah. I Simple mean, as that. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. there's no magic in procedural irregularity, procedural invalidity, none of that. Or where the dispute is being litigated. Absolutely not. But um, the other point you were making yesterday is that the mere fact that you have an arguable dispute with the revenue doesn't mean you necessarily have a reasonable excuse. You may do. And I'm just wondering what sort of factors would be relevant to determining whether you do, bearing in mind the, um, the, the unsatisfactory uh, position of having to conduct a mini-trial of the merits of the dispute? That, the answer to that, my lady, um, is that, say, uh, it, 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 the, it, it, can, I, can, I, can I respond in this way? I do promise I'm going to answer your question, but, but, but um, um, to do it coherently and completely, and I start from this place. Say you had, um, and this is going to arise in surcharge proceedings, that's where it's going to matter whether you had a reasonable yeah. excuse or not. Say the, um, reasonable excuse put forward by the taxpayer was illness. The tribunal's always going to have to assess, I mean, call it a mini-trial if you like, but in these surcharge proceedings, the um, stepped Perrin analysis of what do you say happened, have you made that good, did it cause you to not pay the tax, and was it objectively reasonable in not yeah. paying the tax? And the onus is on you, the taxpayer, at all three stages. So, as I say, you can call that a mini trial if you like, but you're in a world. But in well, it was a mini trial about the merits of the dispute, and rather than a mini trial about whether it's a reason, whether the facts of the of the excuse are established, whether the, the excuse did cause the default, and whether it was objectively reasonable. And in my respectful submission, given the statutory framework that I've gone on and on and on about, the very fact that. It, it, um, the alleged putative reasonable excuse would involve uh, uh, a, 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 a mini anticipated assessment of the merit shows that that can't be a reasonable excuse. You have got to show, uh, uh, if you're the taxpayer, you've got to show that there's a reason to disturb the default position that you pay your tax. If you're in a, I'm sorry, my lady, please. You pay your tax. Well, that the taxpayer would say that begs the question. Uh, and if I please, might respond. Yeah. You have to have a reasonable excuse, a, a good enough reason, to not pay the tax. That's what the taxpayer's got to show: a reason that is good enough to not pay the tax. Can we just not be more simple about this? I mean, reasonable excuse is reasonable excuse. It's just a reasonableness test, is it? I mean, it's no shifting default or assumptions either way or anything like that. It's just, does the taxpayer have a reasonable excuse for not having paid the tax in this circumstance? Yes, but we're giving meaning, my lady, to the word what, what is reasonable. And yes. that is informed by the statutory regime that says, uh, in particular, when you've got a uh, uh, um, a liability which is within the scope of the APN regime or the DPN regime, that the money, presumptively the tax, should be with the, the revenue until that dispute has been resolved. So what counts as reasonable? My lady is quite right. Of course my lady is right. We're, we're looking at what is reasonable. That, that word is given legal content. And what is reasonable is informed by, so I'm not begging the question, uh, 
reconciled. I don't, I don't accept that at all. Uh, the court has to grapple with what does reasonable mean? What is a good enough reason to not pay your tax in the context of this regime as to where uh, 59C, um, little 9, is located? And that's why I've gone on and on and on about the, the, the statutory regime. And the description of that statutory regime, I'll, I'll show you Beadle, but the description of that statutory regime that said it's, it, it's there to deter taxpayers from doing these schemes in the first place, that they get to hang on to the money until the, the, the dispute is um, resolved. And that's why the, um, the tribunals, in grappling with um, the, the, this notion of procedural, what they call the procedural invalidity as to whether that reason is good enough, have used words like high degree of confidence, certainty, robustly based. So in my respectful submission, and this is a debate that needs to be aired, of course it does. It's not good enough to say, well, reasonable means reasonable. Reasonable means reasonable in the context of this statutory regime. And that's why I said, and my lady, Lady Justice Falk, um, uh, uh, um, reacted. and. and you got the pronunciation right yesterday, Falk. Oh, Falk, yes. <laughs> I get gosh all the time. You know, it happens. Um, I don't apologize. usually correct, but you did change from this. No, I, I, I'm very sorry. Uh, no, it's, it, it's very, uh, no, it's very annoying when somebody says your name wrong. I'm very sorry. Um, I've lost my thread. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, now, um, so having said all that about lo lo locating that, that's why I said and we'll, we'll see this when we get to Beadle. In a substantive dispute, the scheme works, the scheme doesn't work. No. No matter how strong you think your case is, no matter how strong your case actually turns out to be, the revenue gets the tax subject to postponement, which you lose and all that. So why is this case different? The taxpayer has got a, sort, a strong substantive case, will say the revenue's case is hopeless. Of course this scheme works, etc., etc. Here, they're saying, well, it's at a different stage. It's not the computation of the tax. Your collection mechanism is defective. Your assessment and collection mechanism is defective. But you're still construing tax provisions in the tax code. And you're having a fight with the revenue about it. It's different to my 100 million example. Where the taxpayer says, well, it's just wrong. But why? I don't understand that. Isn't it the same? I mean, it, it may be that the 100 million example is different because the taxpayer says, I simply can't pay 100 million. Um, and, and it's ob so obviously wrong, I'm not going to. But, but why, is, why is 100 million different from there's no calculation at all? Uh, because the 100 million is what in the words of, 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 of the tribunals, is a gross and obvious error that ought to be correctable by representation be before you even have the, um, the, uh, any argument before the tribunal. It is so gross, so obvious. Because we're testing, going back to the point raised, raised by my lady, uh, lady Justice Whipple, what makes your reason good enough? where otherwise, if, if it's not good enough, you should have paid the tax and this is surcharge. What, what is it that makes your reason good enough? The fact that you've got an arguable case, wherever you fight it, in my respectful submission, no. That goes against the location of reasonable excuse in this regime, and it goes against the explanation of why we've got this regime in this form, which is to deter taxpayers who think of a dual scheme again hang on to the money. As I, I see. Yeah. As I understand it, you're putting a lot of stress on the APN context. And you're effectively saying there's no relevant distinction between the approach taken in Beadle. Is that, have I summarised that? Except correctly? to this extent, my lady, um, uh, uh, 
everything I've said, yes, is particularly strong, particularly during the APN context, but it makes no difference. Even if you're outside the APN context, you've still got to show there's a reason that's good enough. But I suppose if you're outside the APN context and you're in the ordinary tax appeal context, whether or not postponement might have been available becomes relevant to the statutory context, no? The court can look at it. I, I accept that. It can look at that as a relevant factor. Uh, but it's no more than that. As a matter of principle, you're still asking the same question. Is your reason? And reason here means underlying reason. That's the step to a point. It's not good enough to say, I've got a judicial review on foot, when it's, it's arguable. Underlying reason, same as in step two, why are you taking this judicial review? Is it because you want to hang on to the money to make investments elsewhere or you just don't want to pay the revenue and keep it? And of course, and that's perfectly intelligible, in which case if you're advised you can run a JR, you'll run it. And that reason, in my respectful submission, would not be good enough. I want to keep the money. Why should the revenue have it? So the underlying reason for the JR is what we are assessing. OK, not well, that comes back to the lack of evidence, because I think you're, you're suggesting there that hanging on to the money for as long as possible while I run a JR claim for so long as I can run it uh, is not a good enough reason. But, <coughs> but, but, but to take the alternative, and what, no doubt what the taxpayer would say here, well, I, I have had, and I was shown to have, judges accepted, a, a genuinely arguable, strong, arguable case that I did not owe this money. Not, not that I can just hang on while I try to make my way through the courts. But that would be what I'm going to call the step to error. In the same way the revenue said, you're saying you don't have enough money. That's enough to not be a reasonable excuse. Held by uh, this court, well, no. Why didn't you have enough money? It's because your um, uh, customers didn't pay you on time. Here, as my lady, Lady Justice Falk says, look, I've been told I've got a good JR and sh uh, shown to be right, even though I end up losing. Why are you running it? Well, you may be running it because you ultimately think that if you've got a strong case, you will not have to pay the tax. You are under no legal obligation to pay that amount. Well, that might be right, my lady. But if you're looking for an underlying reason, the underlying reason why the taxpayer is not paying, that is a function of evidence. Unless it's blindingly obvious. Yes. Well, it's still a function of evidence, but it's it, it, it's a it's a, a, a function of a finding of fact. Yeah. So, the, but but you might reach it by looking at what the courts have said without necessarily needing to hear what Mr. Archer says about it. Well, in in um, uh, yes, it's theoretically possible. Uh, but in my respectful submission, my respectful submission, most improper, uh, in a world in which Mr. Archer has not been cross-examined as to what his underlying reason for running the GR might be, it might have been. And in, uh, and in the light of the material, I, I shall also show the court. So if the court's thinking about doing it, in my respectful submission, the court shouldn't do it. Uh, that that job has been done by the upper tribunal in remaking its decision. Yes, the Court of uh, Appeal has got power, I, I know that, to remake a decision. But this case has been through two fact-finding tribunals. I, 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 I rather work myself up into... Um, uh, uh, um, anti-remaking rage I, I shall <laughs> um, uh, I shall come back to my submissions but my, my lady, Lady Justice Falk is right I'm tying together what I said yesterday so I'm saying I don't care where you're fighting this case you're having a fight with the revenue and unless you show there's a reason that's good enough uh, uh, to have not paid your tax then you should have paid your tax and you get a search and what you invite us to do is, as a matter of statutory construction, read into the provision that talks about
about re reasonable excuse, um, if you like, some of the background factors. And I think, I think where that lands up is that reasonable excuse means something different in APM territory than it does if there's no APM issue. You get there, I would say, in a, um, in a slightly different way, that um, as a matter of authority, but I think this is right in principle, um, so I'd be making the same point in, in any court, you have to take account of, one has to take account of all relevant circumstances. And that's everything. what Perrin says. Perrin says you take account of all the facts and circumstances. Exactly right, which is why, on a much more prosaic level, illness of a sole trader is very different to the illness of a tax manager in a PLC. Uh, whether or not it's reasonable, if you're behaving as a reasonable taxpayer, using the language, this is at stage three, whether what you've done is reasonable, uh, uh, knowing and being equipped with um, the knowledge of you know exactly what your tax charge is, you know exactly uh, why it is in the conclusions in the closure notice the revenue has said um, we are not giving you these losses. In a world in which the revenue say it's true, there's a fight to be had about whether we've successfully amended, but it's a proper fight. It's one the revenue ended up winning. Is that reason the fight? The fact that you also, the taxpayer also has a, a an arguable JR uh, 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 case, good enough to not pay your tax, or should he, which is my respectful submission, have paid his tax and had that fight? And just in parentheses, this is not an access to justice. Parliament's given you this regime. Also, in the light of, and th this arose from my lady, Lady Justice Powell, um, her observations yesterday. It's a scheme with an APN territory, it's true, um, even though not determined according to the uh, upper tribunal, not postponable. But even if that's wrong, in the revenue's own hand to make the determination, so that on any view is not postponable, and the postponement is lost if the taxpayer loses, as Mr. Archer was bound to after the first year tribunal anyway. All of those are relevant. So absolutely in response to my, my lady, Lady Justice Whipple, what is reasonable for one taxpayer is not reasonable for another taxpayer. Quite right. But the standard we apply is one of sort of a cohort of like-minded taxpayers in a similar situation. So you do, I think, clean car and things ask you to, and parents says you look at you know, what, what others in a similar situation might have done. It's a sort of taxpayer on the Clapham omnibus test. Well, so it's, it's not just, you don't just look at this one, and, uh, and nor is there an abstract. I mean, you do look at what taxpayers would do. Well, I, I um, uh, excuse me, I repeat what I said earlier. It's got to be an actual excuse hmm. in the hands of this actual taxpayer, which actually caused the non-payment of tax, and then you get to whether it's reasonable. Hmm. And then that it's at that third stage um, that in assessing what is objectively reasonable, mm -hmm. uh, one looks at what a responsible taxpayer mm -hmm. in that taxpayer's shoes mm -hmm. would yeah. do. Yeah. And exactly. I am saying, and so that's how I'm putting it. And I'm saying here, a responsible taxpayer, knowing everything that Mr. Archer knew, would pay the tax and have that fight and get his money back if he, if he wins. Well, he'd either pay the tax or he'd recognise the consequences if he didn't. Exactly right. And just about that, that's exactly to anticipate um, what uh, Mrs Justice Elizabeth Lang said in, in, in uh, uh, Dun and Gray. A taxpayer's entitled to take a risk and say, well, I think I'm going to win. And if I win, everything falls away, the tax and the penalty. And if I lose, well, I get both. And it's open to me, to go back to where it was 10 minutes ago, to say, well, in this case, whatever um, comprised my GR action might be a reasonable excuse. So that's open, it's possible. I'm just saying not in this case, the case before this court. Yes, I mean, what really comes down to this point, leaving causation to one side, is the standard to which you hold the hypothetical, reasonable, compliant taxpayer, the sort of key, you know, the 
the taxpayer with the attributes described in, in the card. And standing in Mr Archer's shoes. Yes, in Mr Archer's shoes with, with his, his advisors he had. Which includes well advised. Exactly right. Exactly right. And when we're on causation, just to reprise what I said yesterday, this is really not going to take very long, but this will help me whistle through the cases. So uh, that's the narrative. That's what this case is about. Was Mr. Archer's reason um, good enough? But good enough, reasonable, needs work done as to what that word means in this context, in this regime. Not good enough to say, well, reasonable means reasonable. That, that's not okay. Uh, so we have. Uh, this arguable JR claim, but I'll just go through this to, 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 to um, make it neater when I get to the cases. That ceased when he lost in the administrative court on 21st February. After that, he was exercising rights of appeal. Seventh March, he gets permission from uh, uh, my Lord Lord Justice Henderson. Thirty-first. Uh, so, so then he's got his arguable JR. But it's a back, but it's a. It's a remember, we'll be, we're looking throughout the period. So from seventh March to whatever it was, thirtieth um, uh, uh, November, twenty seventeen, it's the arguable JR again, and then that ceases. And between then and thirteenth June, he's exercising rights of appeal again. And about that, what I've said, I've done the point to death, but it is critical. And it's, 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 it's in my respectful submission, un, un, unfair to criticise the revenue for making this submission when Mr Archer wasn't there to cross-examine. To say, well, the question here is, what was the underlying reason for running this JR? And did it cause you not to pay the tax, or was the underlying reason something other? You just want to hang on to the money. And just about that, Mr Archer has expressly disavowed reliance on advice. You heard Mrs Brown say that yesterday. Mm. Um, for your note, page 92, line 23. Now, Mr. Archer was being advised. What's the, what are you referring to? Line, is there a, a transcript? transcript. I haven't yeah. got it. Anybody, the way else has got it? Yeah. yeah. It was sent to us yesterday. I didn't get it. Well, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I can provide it to you. Well, shall I, please may I continue? Yeah. Uh, um, and again, we, we, we don't know that. We've got no evidence. And then, was it reasonable? For all the reasons I've given, no. Even if you get that far, no. And I don't accept, as it happens, I, uh, there's any question of causation by operation of law. I don't, absent a deeming provision, I, I, I think that's not a, 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 an intelligible um, uh, basis to find causation. Blindingly obvious? Um, no. Uh, because we don't know what the underlying reason was. We, 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 we literally we simply don't know. We know we got, we know we had an article of JR. Same as in parents, uh, not parents, step to the taxpayer couldn't pay. What mattered was why he couldn't pay. An exercise in rights of litigation in any forum, in my respectful submission, in this statutory regime is not of itself reasonable excuse. I can appeal, wait, you're not going to get the money, that's a good enough reason that I've got rights of appeal. Do you mean when you say in this regime, the APN regime, or do you mean generally? I mean in the context of this case, which is 59B5 plus Section 55 plus the APN regime. That's what we're looking at for Mr Archer in this case. And the... The, the 
the, the other duty to be uh, um, oh, uh, uh, and uh, is that well it would have rendered it being payment of this tax would have made the, the tax uh, made the JR nuggetary no, you've got my point you could have paid 14 million, you could have paid all of it and had a declaration and if he had paid it and he'd won, he would have got his money back um, This has a feel of assertion about it, I mean these are really difficult points um, is it is it not fair just to say there was a risk of JR being derailed? There was a risk he wouldn't have got his money back if he'd paid the tax. And the whole point of the JR was that he didn't want to pay the £22 million interest or subsequent interest. Please may I respond as follows. One, um, whether or not he thought there was a risk is a function of evidence. We don't know. Well, it's a legal issue, isn't it? I mean... No, my lady, it's not. Why, it, can't, it, it, why can't a judge of the admin court say, was there a risk that the, the JR would have been derailed? Money it, and what Mr Archer has to show is that risk was what caused him yeah. not to pay the tax. So there may have been, it. sorry, there may have been a legal risk, we can all acknowledge the legal risk, but was it that risk that led to him not paying the tax? Exactly right. And just while I'm Less here, I may as well do this now, because uh, to, 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 to kill, that, that's right. Uh, and um, please may I show you, because um, in my respectful submission, I, um, the revenue shouldn't be having to do this, but I will, because the point is, legal risk or not, the question is, what was as a, a matter of Mr Archer, did he think it was a risk? Uh, please, if you have the supplementary bundle, um, it's behind tab 40, page 232. Now, what this is, please let me know when you've, you've got it. This is the revenue's objections to after the Court of Appeal decision on 30th November 2017. Uh, Mr Archer applied for interim relief and the revenue had objected. And if you look at 2, 3, sorry. I was listening. Um, and I'll show you, I'll show you the basis on, uh, uh, on, on which uh, Mr Archer made his application. But if you look at paragraph 22, little d, it's recorded that the revenue will pay Mr Archer his money back if he wins. It says so. So forget legal risk. When, when, did, when, did, they, when did they say that? Uh, this was... I can see was. when the acknowledgement of service was. That I can see that, uh, sorry, the notice of objection was. But they say the respondents have stated. I just wondered when Oh, they yeah, had. and I can't, I can't. But it was before this notice of objection. Well, it must have been, because it says they had I know. Stated. Well, it, I'm, ju I'm just wondering if you can help me with that. I, 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 I'll try my Perhaps lady, but, I, I, um, yeah. but the point I'm making is that the period of default is from 4th March 2016 to uh, 21st June 2017. On any view, as from that date, he didn't have any risk. Forget legal risk. Um, if you want to see uh, paragraphs 10 to 12 that 22D refers to, um, sorry, give me a minute, it's on pages, um, it's behind tab 36, page 209. And what they say is the sort of thing that Mrs. Brown was saying, you know, who knows if you'll get her money back, there are other proceedings. Sorry, I missed the reference. I was oh, my lady, I'm sorry. Uh, it's um, tab 36, page 209. This is his application to the Supreme Court. Behind that uh, is yeah. also an application for interim. So he's relief. making the Woolwich point. Yeah. In ten. And we're responding. The revenue is responding in, in what I've just shown you to the application for interim relief. Yeah. So it's the same. Okay. Thanks very much. That's yeah. But that's that's the danger of what, treating something as which is in truth question of evidence, a function of evidence, 
findings of fact and elevating that to a, 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 a principle, a function of analysis. No. Um, the very fact that Mr. Um, Archer got interim relief, well, it's the same old point. It, uh, he lost it on the 21st of February. He got it back again on the 7th of March. And then he, he, he lost it again on the um, 30th of November. And the revenue are agreed not to pursue the debt until uh, the Supreme Court delivered its, its, um, uh, its uh, uh, decision on permission. And just about that, the um, the the uh, Supreme Court's refusal. Uh, that's at forty one, page two three four to two three five, and it simply says, uh, uh, "I don't need to take the court to it. The court can look at it without any gloss put on it by me." There is no arguable case, and just about that. Well, it does not raise an arguable point of law. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yes, of course, they were applying the second appeals criteria, but on its, it, it, again, a dangerous exercise as to whether the court, the Supreme Court, was saying well, it's all to do with public importance, or you take it at face value to say, well, no, your case well, is Well, they open. say it doesn't raise an arguable point of law. Should it says it's so. just, yeah. Absolutely, you take it at face value. So forget judicial review uh, becoming nuggetary. Forget uh, the closure notice as being defective. Well, that's the, um, this is the next reason it's excuse. I've, I've dealt with that. So I'm, I've lost a, I've dropped a stitch. It's my yeah. fault. We were on the nuggetary point. And I've said. Uh, and, we, and you took us to some stuff about the Woolwich non-recovery, but that's not the same thing as the, the nuggetary point is the JR falls away. If I pay the tax, there's nothing to argue about because it uh, becomes uh, academic. I think what I'm saying about nuggetry is, number one, there wasn't an actual risk, let alone a legal risk, because of what I've just shown you, the revenue said. Number two, uh, even if it was a legal risk, you can't speculate as to whether that was what caused Mr. Archer not to pay the tax. Number three, on any, I say as a matter of law, it, even if Mr. Archer had paid the tax, he would have got his money back, because it, it, it would have been assessed ultra viris. His nuggetry risk was that um, and it's the point. It's the point that um, this is Justice Leng in Dunn looks at, and we looked at some other stuff yesterday about this. Was that the, the JR court would have said, "We're not going to touch this JR because you've paid the tax now. There's nothing for us to decide." Yes, and I I, I don't accept that at all. For the, uh, uh, the, the 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 admin court would have been perfectly within its rights uh, to say, "Well, I see that you've paid the tax, but you need to know if you get your money back. We've got a live issue uh, because you say." in this court, um, you shouldn't have been made to pay the money back. And uh, No, no, you no, no you, I'm sorry, I think we're at cross-purposes, Mr. Ghosh. The risk was the, the admin court judge would have said, I'm not going to determine, I'm not going to hear this JR because it's now academic. But it, it pays isn't. The tax. Why is it academic? He's, he's got, he wants it repaid. He wasn't bound to pay it. But it's not academic. My, my so, well, I, I, here we are, a range of views. You know, you have two admin court judges sitting here. Uh, and the point that's made against you is there was a risk that yeah. an admin court judge, busy, da 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 da, would have said, I'm not going to deal with this. It's gone. Well, because you paid the tax. Well, my lady, um, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to take this point much further because I, I'm just going to be saying the same old thing. Number one, um, no, there wasn't that risk because there was a live issue. Because you'd say to the ad uh, administrative court judge, I know I've paid the tax. But um, actually, I shouldn't have. And so I want a declaration from you that there is no debt and I want my money back. Two, and I, so I don't accept that at all. Two, so it's not academic. He could have paid 14 million of tax to avoid the surcharge and, and the, the 11 million would have still been on foot. That's in my skeleton. Yeah. But maybe the other point to make is that you've shown us what the revenue said in response yeah. to the application of the Supreme Court, and that, of course, is in the context that the reasonable excuse has to be demonstrated throughout. Exactly the right. So, again, uh, I don't want to work myself into state over it, but, but this is not an academic point on any view. And the other point is that 
even if it even if this was potentially a legal risk, even if that was right, as a function of evidence, Mr. Archer would have had to show that was what was in his mind throughout the period. Yeah, well, you've got that point. Yeah. That's all I want to say um, about nuggetry. And then I was going on to say there were other reasonable excuses put forward. One of them was, well, look at the closure notices. Well, that's the dispute. can't use the fact of the dispute in my respectful submission as saying, well, I've got a reasonable excuse. The fact that I've got interim relief. Well, I've said, this is what I was done before we went back, we went back to Nuggetry. Um, we went uh, interim relief. Well, that, I've said that stopped when he lost on the 21st of February, got it back again on the 7th of March, and he lost it again. And what Mr. Archer can't say is, oh, well, um, the revenue agreed to not pursue the debt until the Supreme Court gave permission or didn't give permission. Um, so what? That's not interim relief. That's the revenue saying we won't pursue the debt. Well, why isn't that a, a basis on which he could say, well, if the revenue aren't pursuing the debt and they're not worried about delay, that's not if we're looking at that extra period, I, I had a, if he's right about a reasonable, reasonably arguable dispute, however it was litigated, why isn't that something he can rely on as showing that it wasn't an unreasonable delay to wait for that extra six months? Uh, because what the revenue is saying, uh, and said consistently, there is a debt, you should be paying it, you're just undertaking not to, not to pursue you. Yeah. And you should have paid it. That's what the revenue is saying. They're, they're, they've been, um, they were originally stopped from enforcing it because of these interim relief orders. And then they said, all right. And there's no evidence as to what the reasons were for the revenue saying that they didn't want to have to go and, 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 and participate in an expedited hearing. Yeah. But I'm not, um, I, I can't help you more as to why they didn't want yeah. to do that. No, and I'm not asking. But, but you say the mere fact that the revenue agree not to do what the courts have told them that they mustn't do pending resolution of the debt doesn't mean it was reasonable for him not to pay. Uh, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I adopt um, what the upper tribunal said about the um, self-assessment forms collection suspended. And all of that I said yesterday, I'll say it again now, cuts across section 1182. The court is well aware of section 1182 that the revenue can agree. Mm. The parliament's given a mechanism and originally, Mr. Archer ran the point that we did have that. They've dropped that now. It's, uh, 1182 is um, time to pay, is it? 1182 is the revenue, yeah. if the revenue agrees to, 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 for, uh, to, to um, not pursue, in this case, a debt, you, um, you're not treated as not having done something that the revenue has agreed that you, you don't have to do it. OK, so you say at one stage the tax payer, Mr. Archer, was arguing that it had the, he had the benefit of an agreement within that provision. That, that, and, and not and that argument is not true. Yes. Yes, my lady, I'm saying that. And then, um, this question of hypothetical appeal would have led to postponement. I can't face talking about postponement again. I, 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 um, <laughs> I think um, we've got, I think we've got uh, the I, um, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, please then, may I, may, may I go on to show you the, the, the material? Now, just for your note, uh, the, the, the revenue consistently said to, to Mr. Archer, you owe us the money, you owe us the money, you owe us the money. Tab 5, page 12 to 13. Is, uh, is this supplementary bundle? Supplementary bundle, yeah, yes, my lady, sorry. Tab 6, 14 to 16. So you're going to give us a list? Yes, what, what, yeah, I'm just giving us a it, list. It, it's okay. going to sound like can the shipping forecast. Can you start the list forecast. again? Let's have a shipping forecast. Yeah. Yeah. Start Go the list me. again. Tab uh, 5. 12 to 13. Um, tab 6, 14 to 16. Tab 33, 174 to 175. These are just for instances, and you've, you've also seen the objections I've already shown you uh, to, 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 to agenda relief. 
what you've also got, please may, uh, please may show you this, um, it's uh, Mr Justice Jay's decision in, uh, in the Administrative Court, tab 23 of the supplementary bundle. I'll take it short, but it's important. It's paragraphs 96 to 99 at pages 140 to 141. And this is simply Mr Justice Jay saying, uh, Mr Archer knew everything. It, 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 it's not an easy judgment to understand, I won't lie. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, he says, well, Justice Jay is not here to defend himself. <laughs> um, he says, 114 doesn't cure the uh, motion notices before me, but if, you, if you'd gone to the FTT, it, it, it would have cured it before yeah. them. Um, uh, uh, Sorry, which, which, which bits did you want us to look at? I was looking at 96 just, to 99. Yeah. Is that what it, you wanted to see? 96, in fact, all the way to 101, page 140 to 141. It's just for your note. Yep. That is what tells you what Mr Archer knew. And that's what the Court of Appeal rely on? The Upper Tribunal. Oh, at the Court of Appeal, yes, yeah. and also the Upper Tribunal and, and, and the First tribunal in this case. That's right. Um, but also 106, picking up a point that my lady, Lady Justice Falk, um, raised yesterday. 106 on page 142. It's the last sentence. Please, if you have that. I mean, talks about Morton's Cork and all that. But um, He then says, but my decision on the principal issues, please does the court have that? Yeah means that there is no, now no possibility of an appeal, because he says um, uh, you shouldn't be here, uh, it's an abusive process, and if you go off to the FTT, uh, you'll lose. Um, and the taxpayer must pay up, because my lady, Lady Justice Falk said that it was in the order, but it's also on the face of the decision. Now, why that's relevant is because, again, assessing, is your reason for paying or not paying good enough And you can either have a very long or a very short conversation about this. You've got a judgment which is not easy to understand, but this is easy to understand. <laughs> He's being told, Mr. Archer, by the administrative court, you must pay up. It's an odd thing. He says, my decision on the principal issues means there's now no possibility of an appeal, which must mean an appeal to the CA, to, the, to this court. And then says he's not going to express any view on the technical points, which, if he is overturned by the Court of Appeal, which of course he was, might live to fight another day. It's odd, isn't it? Um, uh, but, yeah, yeah, it's an odd decision, but all I'm saying is... is, is um, <laughs> it's, um, you, you, you're saying everyone can understand pay up. <laughs> yeah, I am saying that. I am saying everybody can un understand pay up. And, and that's important in the, in the context of this case. Yeah, and the only reason I picked you up is because he seems to be saying, and, and again, I'm sorry, it's just a, it's very basic, there's no possibility of an appeal, so the taxpayer must pay up. Well, history, as we know, tells us there was a possibility of an appeal, and off we went. So you kind of you land up in a different place, don't you? Well, um, what, what, what this tells you is that throughout the period, as, you, as you're assessing um, what was in Mr Archer's head and what was his reason for not paying, this is one of the things you're looking at as that 21st February um, 2017. I mean, in a sense, you, the, in a sense, without the evidence, the taxpayer, we can look at what the courts have said and take them at face value, but the taxpayer can't say, in light of what the court said at each stage, that he always had the same very arguable or strongly arguable or arguable case because at face value the courts changed their minds throughout and so the, I mean, you might have a situation where you would want to show your robust evidence your robust advice to the tax tribunal to show that notwithstanding what the court said my robust advice throughout was I had a really good case um, but what you can't do is just look at at these decisions at face value and say that the situation stayed exactly the same throughout. That's really That's what exactly what, and that's what I've been saying. Sorry. Uh, no, no, uh, I, no, please don't apologise, it's, it's me. Uh, but but, but um, that's exactly what I've been saying. And actually, just in parentheses, um, we, of course we haven't seen the advice. We don't know whether 
they said, oh, goodness, this is all a bit tricky, but have a go at appealing and let's see what happens. Or, um, no, 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 you've got a 99% chance. Um, press on. Mm. We, we, we don't know. But picking up a point that was made earlier, that the if, if that's the right way to approach it, then you get into looking at the the mini trial of merits mm. of the underlying JR mm. claim, which which is of concern. It, we can see it caused concern to the tribunal in Chile, and we understand that. It's not a concern that's been fully resolved. And I think what I'm saying is that it's a sign that a tribunal or a court is looking at a reason that's not good enough if you've got the science. That's why, right at the beginning, at the beginning when I started my submissions this morning, and, and in particular, my lady justice, my lady, Lady Justice Falk, um, reacted when I said, if you've got, an, if the revenue's got an arguable case, it's it's one way of expressing this point. That shows that you haven't, you, the taxpayer, haven't got a good reason for not paying. It's not like a hundred million. It's not like the gross uh, 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 or, or obvious error. I've said a tribunal has to conduct an exercise of deciding on the facts whether somebody got a reasonable excuse or not, where you will, weren't you will, all that. So you might you might have a case where there's there's a proper dispute. Each side has a reasonably arguable case, and you say that's not enough to constitute a reasonable excuse. You would want to see what it was um, about this particular taxpayer and the reason why um, this particular taxpayer didn't pay. Exactly right, my lady, and I'd go further. I'd say that the concern ex uh, uh, that the tribunal had in, in, in Chile, well, what are we supposed to do if you're saying the reason the excuse is a, an arguable JR? Um, are we supposed to conduct a mini trial and, and end up, well, that's a sign your very analysis, the very embarkation of considering the JR uh, as, a, as, as a reasonable excuse is wrong. But that's not what Shining said. What Shining said is we need to do something different if we're in that territory where we don't know if it's a JR or not. We need to then, we then do need to look at subjective belief on the part of the taxpayer. Uh, I'll show you, I'll show the court. Mm. Um, I, and I need to know, um, <laughs> since we've, we've gone there, whether it is Shining or Shining because um, <laughs> um, I can't help you. Uh, I'd have said Sheeling, but yes. my lady says Sheeling. I don't Shiling. mind at all. We'll um, call it Sheeling. That's fine. Well, it's either whether, it's either whether they mind. But, um, um, it's E.I. and I'm not yes. Sheeling yeah. in my view. Um, where was I? Well, I remember. Now, um, the concern, and, and we have to look at this, the concern that Judge Scott, in particular, I think it was him, I, there were two of them, but anyway, he's, he was one of them, um, I think was misconceived. Because he, he was saying, look, looking at Beetle, I can quite see that I shouldn't be looking at this as a reasonable excuse. I shouldn't be looking at it. Um, but what I'm really worried about uh, is what he called this mini-trial. I shouldn't be embarking on a mini-trial. And I'm saying that's at least a sign. I'm not elevating anything I'm saying to a formula or a principle. It's a sign that if in order to resolve whether a taxpayer's got a reason that's good enough not to pay the tax, a tribunal's got to um, replicate what some other court's going to have to look at, it's a sign that it's not a reasonable excuse. You shouldn't be looking at it. I don't understand uh, why that follows. It follows, my lady, because I, I can hardly bring myself to say it, but you're, you're in this regime where you've got to pay the tax, subject to postponement, all that. So to displace that, you've got to show you've got a reason that's good enough. Mm. Your reason, if you're the taxpayer, you say, oh, so I've got this other dispute elsewhere. And the question is, well, should you pay the tax and carry on having that dispute, and if you win, you get your money back? Well, no, you don't have to pay the tax. And I'm saying, in that world, a reason that's good enough to displace what statute says, which is that otherwise you have to pay this tax, the fact that you're having litigation, which is arguable for both sides, that's what, on, almost elevate this to a principle, that's never going to be a reasonable excuse. Pay the tax, have your dispute, if you get it wrong, get your money back. Exactly what Mrs Justice Elizabeth Lang said in Dun & Gray. Okay, 
So you're really saying, among other things, that Schilling shouldn't have distinguished the approach taken in dealing. Yes, I am. I am saying that. I'm saying you leave room for any sort of um, putative reasonable excuse, and you assess, as my lady, Lady Justice Whipple said, is this reason good enough in this case for this tax rate? Turning to the, the, the Court of Appeal, uh, 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 in, um, in the JR proceedings, uh, that's tab 31, and the relevant paragraphs, you've seen these, uh, 42 and 43 at 170 and 171. Uh, with the Court's permission, I'll take it short. Um, first, as it happens, it is overturned. I think what my Lord, Lord Justice Lewis is saying is, um, Mr. Justice, I, I, I'm unpacking what he's saying. I think what he's saying is, look, Mr. Justice Jay dismissed uh, the application in the administrative court by saying he should have been elsewhere. That's a slightly curious approach, given that he got permission to go there in the first place. But anyway, put that to one side. Um, he's saying, well, here, actually, 114 does cure these closure notices, so I don't have to go there about alternative remedies. Um, I don't have to look at whether you should have been here or should have been elsewhere. Um, so that's what makes it overture. But then he says, well, I'm going, I've got things to say. Um, and he says, well, uh, you could have, you, you get to come here. And that's a point made by, I think, all three of um, your ladyships yesterday. Um, Mr. Uh, Archer hadn't appealed. The revenue um, said, well, you haven't paid, you haven't appealed. Give us the money, bankruptcy proceedings. He gets to go to the bankruptcy court if that's what he wants to do. That's what my Lord, Lord Justice Lewison is saying. The only thing I quarreled with was this, what I call the self-interest test, but there's no need to um, address the court on, on, on that now. Um, and at 43, he acknowledges if Mr. Archer could have appealed but he's chosen not to, and he says that. And then taking it short, um, what my Lord Lord Justice Lewis is saying is, well, of course, in what are these collateral proceedings? The FTT's not got any jurisdiction about whether there's a debt for bankruptcy purposes, but the bankruptcy court is permitted to um, uh, construe and apply in, uh, or in, in the context of bankruptcy proceedings, 114 and Section 28A. Well, that's, yes, it is. So, it's, I'm saying this respectfully, it's not saying very much. Then, please, may I turn to Beagle? That's in the authorities bundle, uh, 20, uh, 29. Now, the court's familiar with Beadle. And please, uh, if the court has it, um, it uh, can I uh, pick it up at paragraph 56? on page 398. So what um, Mr. Beadle was saying was there are all sorts of public law reasons why this PPN is bad and the tribunal had said, well, no, um, we can't look at that. We don't have jurisdiction. That was ground A. Ground B, well, he says I've got a reasonable excuse. Um, and it's, well, I'll, I'll take it short because the court knows it. Um, but put short, it's, I, in my respectful submission, it's this case. Um, the F, uh, at 57, the FTT, my, my lady, Lady Justice Minister, the FTT was correct to hold the invalidity or alleged invalidity of PPNs are not matters that can properly be considered in the context of a reasonable excuse defence. The penalties in 
this case it's the surcharges, or in the context of a claim for a reduction of the penalty. This was the revenue discretion. That's uh, the analog of this is in this case 59C11. And endorsing the upper tribunal, and the court can see it, even if the appellant had a reasonable belief, subjectively, objectively, or both, based on professional advice, that he was not liable to pay, this could not form a reasonable excuse for failure to pay the, this PPN. Why? 203. Knowing, I, I'm paraphrasing, knowing the regime a responsible taxpayer would pay. And 209, if they're right, this is the upper tribunal's reasoning endorsed by, by the Court of Appeal, um, put short, you have, you can, it, it, it permits taxpayers to raise collateral proceedings and not pay. And at 59, the Court of Appeal says that that approach is correct. And then it endorses what we've already mentioned what Mrs. Justice Elizabeth Lang says in Dun & Gray. You can take a JR, either pay your tax and take the JR anyway, or don't pay your tax and take a risk. And it's open to you to say the very fact of the JR was a reasonable excuse. And I'm saying all of that, it can be directly read across to this case. Why is this case different? Only reason, it's procedural. And my respectful response to that, and it's not an assertion, so what? It's a construction of section 118 and section 28A. And you leave room for of a closure notice. So it's not like the reasonable excuse about being ill or your computer failing. It's not like that. It's a different um, reason that a taxpayer may say, I'm not paying this. My example is the 100 million. And the tribunal can assess, is that good enough? And that's why the tribunals and the court knows this, say, well, generally that sort of thing should be addressed by representation. You shouldn't get that. Can I just be really clear what you're saying? Let's say there had been evidence here. Uh, about, my lady, I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Uh, let's say there had been, just assume there had been evidence here about Mr. Archer's position all throughout. He was advised about the terms of his claim and so on. Um, are you saying that because, because we should be applying a, the approach in Beadle, whatever he felt, to be the strength of that claim and or the risk of paying up in terms of potential prejudice to the uh, JR proceedings, that still wouldn't be good enough because of the statutory context. I'm absolutely saying that. And uh, in, in a world in which, um, God, I'll, I'll have to say it again, but, but the, the, um, the revenue could have determined the APNs yeah, yes, I, you don't all need that. to repeat that. Yeah. The statutory context, which includes the APN risk. So, an argument in law, where both sides, if it, it might be different, and that's the trouble with these kind of conversations, mm. if the right. revenue were aligned in a section that had been repealed, it was something crazy. Mm. The taxpayer might say, look, I've got advice, this section doesn't apply to me. It was repealed last week or last year. I'm not paying. Well, yes, that's a reasonable excuse. Where the taxpayer says, I'm, I'm fighting you because you're construing the sections differently to me and I'm right and you're wrong. In that world, which is to deter taxpayers from doing schemes within the APN, in this case, that's relevant. Where the revenue's position is not just arguable, it turns out to be right, um, but certainly arguable. You know, 
why would that ever be a reasonable excuse? That's exactly what the other tribunal was saying in the context of Beadle. So the position would have, could have been different in this sort of a case with a procedural invalidity challenge where the closure notice didn't include a self-assessment, an amendment to the assessment, and Mr Archie didn't know what he was meant to pay. If he was misled or confused, that absolutely that, could have been. That would make the, all the difference. But, yeah. but, yeah. Turning it round, you, I think you're more or less saying if the revenue don't have an arguable case, you know, if their, their position is hopeless because the, the legislation's been repealed or they've put 100 million in or whatever it is, then that could be uh, it, that could be a reasonable excuse. Yes. So I mean, I, I I I get it completely that the conversation is difficult, but I'm trying to understand what your position is. I, I hope I, I, it's fairly put that when you're talking about a legal objection, as opposed to a fact, uh, something which is much more fact dependent, illness, computer not working, all that. When you're saying I've got a legal fight with the revenue. And whether that the the, the 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 existence of the taxpayer having legal grounds to fight the revenue, the question is whether that, if ever, can be good enough. And your answer is just most not on no, its own. Not really. Not on isn't its it? own. It's yes. a legal argument that has two sides, even if one is stronger than the other. The answer is no, you don't have a reasonable Yes, excuse. and in my respectful submission, that is a wholly unsurprising result. Somebody's got to have the money unless you put an escrow. The question is whether it should be the taxpayer or the revenue. But that is, and I'll just tell you where, where I am, that is to read into the reasonable excuse provisions, really the APN provisions, and it makes the whole reasonable excuse debate as if there was... Um, a concluded APN. It's, it's as if it was Beadle. And our case isn't Beadle because we're not arguing about an APN fact. In my respectful submission, that's that's an unfair gloss in my submission okay. because I, 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 what I'm saying is you take account of everything and here uh, the cir circumstances that are relevant, it should be accounted for apart from Mr Justice Jay, Jay saying pay up, is a world in which, yes, it was a scheme within the APN, it uh, was possibly unpostponable anyway. It was in the revenue zone own hands to make it unpostponable, uh, and that postponement would have been lost on uh, uh, if uh, Mr. Archer had lost in the FTT, which he could I mean, have to do. Again, just to put a really obvious point to you, if that's what the reasonable excuse provisions were meant to mean, why on earth don't they say that? That the, the, the assumption is that you pay up front, and then you can have your debate wherever, and and. The fact that you've got an ongoing litigation somewhere else is not a reasonable excuse. Why, why not say that? Well, um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but, but, the, <laughs> uh, but, but what we do know is that um, it has to be reasonable, meaning good enough to not pay. We do know that. Mm. And so uh, I think it's, it's unfair to say to the revenue when the onus is on the taxpayer uh, to say, well, it could have been even clearer. Because you always have to leave room for something you don't expect. Mm. Which is why this elasticity of the notion of a reasonable excuse. Mm. Mm. I mean, that's where I... Because you find reasonable as listed all over the domestic statute. It's a per perfectly ordinary concept. Um, but which takes its colour from that context. What you very often see, however, is, you know, factors you should take this into account and not take that into account. And I know you're not the draftsman, but it just... You are reading a lot into two words, reasonable excuse, uh, uh, is, is where I... Sit at the moment. Well, um, I don't accept that, my lady. Uh, I'm saying the word reasonable is given a meaning, and, you, uh, I, and that meaning has got to be gleaned from uh, the circumstances of the taxpayer and where it's located in the regime. So I don't accept the meaning anything. I'm giving reasonable a meaning uh, in, in the same way uh, that there are, there, there are words all over the place in the tax code. Payment that takes its meaning from its context. Nobody's reading anything in because payment means one thing in one case and a different thing in a different case. Nobody well, should be anything in. Of course, are saying it's got a different meaning in this case because it's in a different context. It's easy. So no, I'm not reading anything in. Yeah. I mean, what we are certainly doing is construing reasonable excuse in the context of the surcharge, the surcharge provisions. 
which incorporates the point who should hold the money absolutely right. the revolution of the family dispute. Exactly right. That's all I'm saying. So, uh, anyway, I, I won't go on about it, but it's unfair to, to accuse a revenue to, of, of reading words into these words. I wasn't accusing you of anything, I'm just no. trying to test the proposition and make well, sure I understand it. Yeah, but I'm not. Uh, we're giving the words some, uh, a legal meaning. Please may I show the court shielding. Uh, that is uh, tab 28. And please may I pick it up at paragraph 57 at page 370. So the court's got the point that I say the reasoning in. Um, Beadle endorsing what this is Justice uh, Elizabeth Lang said in Dun and Gray is a, has got a direct lead across to this case. This case is construing 118, uh, no it's not, it's construing 114 in section 28A. Beadle was construing substantial, substantive provisions. So, uh, this is Sheeling, dealing with reasonable excuse. And again, uh, you'll see at 58 that um, uh, th there, was, there was evidence given. And they endorse what um, Judge Hellier said in Chapman. Well, the FTT did in this case. And you'll see that it's at 60 of the decision. And the only reason I'm showing you this is that paragraph 53 of the uh, of the Chapman decision, which is at page 372, which, which the FTT endorsed, you'll see this, um, uh, this observation by Judge Hellier that one shouldn't lightly assume that HMRC have acted unlawfully. So he's looking at something other. He's not looking at a legal dispute. He's saying, hmm, you're telling me that this APN is bad for some reason, you can't assume that lightly in order to say there's a good reason for not paying the tax. Yeah, I think that's 53 of the FTT decision. Yes. That's right, that's right. And then moving on to 66, picking up the point exactly made there by Lady Lady uh, Justice Whipple, there isn't a, a statutory definition of what is a reasonable excuse. And as a matter of principle, I can see, but because the draft person has left room to say, well, there's something I, I didn't expect. So we can, we can look at it. At 66, they endorse Perrin. And then it's at 69 to 71. that the, the upper tribunal in, in, in Sheeling makes this um, distinction between substantive and procedural invalidity. And moving on to 70, paragraph 73, they say, well, Beadle tells us that a substantive invalidity, but I already addressed this yesterday, invalidity is a, an odd word, but it's where it's wrong. That's never a reasonable excuse. The revenue, it says, but that's also true of a procedural invalidity. And then it's at 75 through to 77 that the upper tribunal say, well, let's look at whether a belief that a, a, an APN or in this case, the explosion notices, is procedurally invalid, is capable of being. So you can look at it. It's not like a substantive invalidity. At least we can look at it. And they acknowledge the express purpose is deterring tax avoidance. That's 76. The court's got that. Um, and they're saying, well, this is the first reason why perhaps we shouldn't even be looking at it.
Court of Expl uh, Appeal uh, explained in reaching its decision in the first issue in Guido, the regime has its expressed purpose of deterring market and tax avoidance by removing cash flow benefits. Well, also in this case, there's no difference. And it's the second, the second reason. Um, they say it's, it's, it's correct that we can't even look at procedural um, fights. It's arguable that a penalty appeal before the FTT is the wrong forum to consider procedural invalidity of an APN. And it's at 78, they say, well, OK, these are good reasons to read Beadle across to procedural invalidity. But no, we're not going to do that, because they're different. They say the policy considerations, and these are the critical words that the court has it, considered in Beadle and other cases cannot simply be assumed to apply an undiluted form to procedural invalidity. Well, that might be true in some cases, not this case. Why is that any different in this case? The, 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 the policy considerations that we've done a scheme, it's an APN type scheme, who gets to hold the money? So I don't accept the, 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 the reasoning of the other tribunal in, in, in 78 applies to this case. So you're not you're not necessarily saying shielding is wrong in its approach, but that it shouldn't be applied in this case. I I, I it should certainly shouldn't be applied in this case. I say that the way shielding puts it, the way the other tribunal puts it in shielding, to say to to, to identify a category of procedural invalidity to say that the um, what they're saying is uh, these assumptions about tax avoidance deterrence can't apply to those or don't necessarily apply to those is wrong put like that they will absolutely apply to some so are you you're, do you accept that it may be unduly restrictive to say that a, a challenge to a, a closure notice that effectively says this isn't a closure notice or an APN isn't an APN for, for procedural reasons, might be uh, capable of being Absolutely a accept that. Excuse. It depends. But don't call it procedural invalidity. Exactly. Look at, the, look at what, the, what the argument is. Absolutely. Look at the specific complaint. And how would you then define the sort of complaint that w you would say you can open? The 100 million example. The, um, uh, that it's just the wrong number. Uh, 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 cases like Chapman that say the decimal point's in the wrong place, they've charged you 100 million. So the gross or obvious errors. Which is exactly how the tribunals put it gross or obvious, exceptional. And that's why. At 80, they say we're worried about this mini trial. And at 81, they say, well, we're going to modify the parent approach. We're going to find out what the taxpayer believes and ask whether that's a paraphrasing uh, 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 um, amounts to a good enough reason. I wonder, now it's 12.50, um, I, if, if the court rises, and I, I, I guess I'm going to be 15 minutes more, no more. Thank you very much. We'll rise for five minutes then. Thank you.
reason. Uh, uh, number one, uh, uh, happens uh, when the, the tribunals have had to grapple with um, the post-shielding world. Uh, the, the courts see some of them. They've used words like exceptional, high degree of certainty, um, words of that nature. Uh, really adopt everything they say in a skeleton about that. And there's a reason why they've done that. Uh, in, a, um, in a fight which is a, 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 a one way or another, whether it's substantive or, or procedural, a technical dispute about the construction and application of tax provisions with the revenue, the tribunals have correctly um, intuited that to be good enough to not pay the tax, you need a high degree of certainty, robustly based. And um, I, w I won't take up time showing you the, the, those, those tribunal decisions. Just for your note, the, um, uh, there's uh, I exclusive promotions, which is one of the cases in the, in the bundle, actually expressly deals with whether the interim relief or having an arguable case can amount to reasonable excuse held no. But it's, it's an FTT decision. It doesn't bind this court. Um, I think, uh, with your permission, I'm, to, I'm going to leave that there. Uh, and uh, neither am I, for the, reason, for the reasons I've given, uh, going to deal with Woolwich, because you have my point, uh, that this question doesn't even arise. Well, whatever the position before the 17th of December, you say from the 17th of December there was no question. Yes, and I also say um, that um, insofar as it was a question of risk rather than anything else, we've got no evidence. So, uh, please may I show the, um, the court the upper tribunal decision and, and the, um, uh, the FTT decisions, and that, that will complete my submissions. Uh, I think we've got the documents the court asked for, uh, but I just need to read them to make sure they're, they're the actual documents. Uh, but it, 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 that's not going to take very long at all, so we can undertake to, to give it to the court and to Mr. Archer's team um, by half past two today. The uh, the upper tribunal decision um, that's behind tab seven of the, of the core bundle. Now, uh, this was um, picking up a point raised uh, by my lady, Lady Justice Howe, yesterday. Um, I, I 
paragraph 95 at page 101. The discussion starts at 92 uh, and ends uh, at paragraph 100, but it's dealing with the, 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 the question of postponement. And uh, the way it was put by my lady, Lady Justice Falk, is it, it's exactly right. What, what um, uh, the upper tribunal was saying is, look, we're, um, they're, they're, they're talking about um, section 59C of section 8, capital B to capital D, which says you can't postpone APN tax. Uh, the question is whether the closure notice is um, related, and it, the word relates um, to um, the uh, tax in the APN. Even what the, the upper tribunal says is, well, they haven't been determined. That's true, but they don't need to be for the purposes of these provisions. Um, as it happens, the point's been made. Even if that's wrong, the revenue could have determined and triggered the non-postponement in, in, in any event. But that's all in the context of a critique of the FTT's decision. Because what the, the, the upper tribunal decides at paragraph 115 is um, that the, the uh, well, it's 114 and 115, it's at page 104, uh, is that the, the FTT's decision was bad because the FTT failed to recognise that Mr Archer didn't want to appeal to the FTT because um, it was against his interests. And 114 says we can't be safe mm. that uh, the... Um, um, the revenues take on the FTT that you can identify good reasons. We can't be safe about that. It was, it's an infected decision. So we're going to remake it. That's what the, the, the upper tribunal says at 115. So all, all that discussion about postponement is in one sense for the birds. And it's it's you know they've, they've come to the conclusion one way or another we're remaking the decision. So then they, they turn to Perrin and say, well, all right, we're remaking the decision. They, they set out Perrin and um, uh, the, the authorities and the submissions. Uh, and just about that, at paragraph 134, it's at page 109, you've got the exhaustive list of the material that Mr Archer relied upon. And, and the reason I'm showing you this is because this is in the context of a, a remade decision by the by the upper tribunal. So that's what they were looking at in coming to their decision. And at one three five one three six, you see what Mr. Archer is saying. Any reasonable position, uh, a taxpayer in Mr. Archer's position, in short, wouldn't have paid the tax. But um, Mr. Archer was not saying that the FTT should have inferred he in fact reasonably, uh, reasonably believed that the disputed tax was not due and payable. Yeah, sorry, I've, I've read that before and I can't find it now. 136. 136, my Thank lady, it's at page... One, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so that was an inference, as I read that, that there, that was a disavowal of any inference in connection with what his reasonable belief might have been. Exactly that's right. by the wayside. In this, exactly, well, exactly right, but the reason that's important is what the upper tribunal says about that at 139. And they say the issue they have to determine is whether Mr. Archer was required to establish he had this reasonable belief and that the appropriate course was to challenge the closure notices by JR. So did he have a good enough reason? Um, but in other words, sufficient. Now, this is how the upper tribunal is putting Mr. Archer's case. Is it sufficient? to establish a course of conduct which is objectively reasonable. Uh, the learned friend submitted that in theory, even if Mr. Archer had subjectively thought tax was due and payable, 
he would still have a reasonable excuse because his conduct was objectively reasonable. I think that's wrong. That's a sign you've gone wrong. Because what the tribunal is saying is the approach taken by Mr. Archer is he might have said to himself, and the, the way the case is being put, at least in the upper tribunal, but it, it's equally true of, of, of the way that Mr. Archer is presenting the case here. Um, don't even look at what was in my head. I could have had all sorts of terrible, terrible reasons. I'm not paying the revenue just to annoy them. But looked at objectively at stage three, so forget actual reason, forget causation, look at stage three, that that's objectively reasonable to pursue my JR, that gets me home. And for all the reasons I've delivered, missing out stages one and two is, is not a permitted. What's your actual excuse? Did it cause the non-payment of tax? And the, the point made by the other tribunal here is important. Because if they're right, it doesn't matter, even if he thought to himself, or even advised, actually. I'm going to hope. Oh, well, that was a lucky victory. I'm going to hope. Well, that was another lucky victory. In any case, the court's got the drift. If the taxpayer is right, But do you say you have to have evidence of subjective belief? The, well, you have to have subjective evidence as, what, uh, as to what the taxpayer thinks uh, is, 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 or, or it delivers as to what their reason for not paying was. OK, so that's causation evidence. It, the two bleed into each other. I agree, I agree they do. But just forensically, it helps me just to yes. think about it in a separate... Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily garments. evidence of belief yes. of something, but it is evidence of what cause actually caused the non-payment. Absolutely right. I mean, that, that's rather my point. I just wanted to pick up because um, it, I think that means that it's not necessary to stare into his mind to understand whether he thought it was a good claim or a bad claim. I think where, where we end up is you say there has at least <coughs> to be some evidence before the tribunal to say the reason I didn't pay was because I had my JR exempt. I know other reasons. But you, you say that connector has to be made out evidentially. Yes, I do. Uh, and that's why uh, the way that Milan Friend put it yesterday was, oh, where would we all be? You've got to prove a negative as all the things I wouldn't be. It's not that. The onus is on the taxpayer. Present the evidence. Why did you not pay the tax? Why did you not pay the tax? And then assess at stage three, was that objectively good enough? But hold on a minute. Just going back to para 139. That means that Mrs. Brown is right, isn't it? That he could still, well, he could still say, he could still assert um, that the reason he didn't pay his tax was because he had the JR up and running, um, regardless of what he thought in his heart about the merits of the JR. It, no, it can't be right, because the, the, the onus is on the taxpayer to show they've got a reason which is good enough, not just good, but good enough and not a bad reason. So uh, what the upper tribunal is saying there is, even if in your heart you had a bad reason, that was what actually caused the non-payment of tax. Running the case the way that Mr. Arch is running it before this court, and indeed the upper tribunal, if you can show that looking at the court documents, objectively you had a good JR, that's enough. Who cares what's in your heart? Who cares what actually caused the non-payment of tax? Okay, I'm not sure I quite follow, but um, um, let's move on. Uh, it's a critical point. Um, The underlying reason, call it the step to reason. What caused you to not pay the tax? Tell us. The mere fact you've got a JR isn't enough. Why do you? Why did you run the JR? But if I, I just want to, so I've got on board your submission that there's no such thing as blindingly obvious. That it's an evidence matter. You have to evidence before the FPT what caused you not to pay the tax in fact. I've got that on board. But the question I ask you is, does that necessarily involve disclosing the subjective belief? In other words, I think it's a really good claim, for whatever reason. Or is it enough just to say, um, I'm not going to pay the tax because I've got this JR up and running, and in fact, I've been given permission on it, and I've got in, um, uh, interim relief on it, 
And in those circumstances, that's my reason for not paying the tax. And I'm saying that second approach can't be good enough because the revenue gets to interrogate whether that's A, the truth. Uh, and uh, in the sense of, I know you've got a good JR because Mr. Archie keep telling me you've got a good JR and now you've, you've, you've shown that you had a, a good enough JR. But was that the reason that caused you to not pay the tax? I think you may be at cross -tax. Yes, I, was, I think you are. I, I think it's because um, you, the words assert were used, perhaps. But you're saying there must be evidence mm -hmm. about it, however that evidence is produced. It yes. may be the most straightforward way to produce the evidence is for Mr Archer to go into the witness box and say this is... I've got a JR and this is the reason and then the revenue can cross-examine him exactly um, but what's not good enough is for is for Mr Archer just simply to point to the fact that he's got leave to pursue his JR and invite the court to infer that that's the reason yes so I've either got to invite the inference and the revenue would say well you can't yeah. but but yes exactly right that, that that's very fairly good I think, among other things, you're, you're relying on the fact that no inference was relied on below. Well, I'm saying that that's been expressly disavowed below, so mm -hmm. you're left with blinding the obvious. take the, um, uh, the remainder of this judgment uh, short uh, at 142 the, um, the upper tribunal looked at shielding looked at a case called Sequoia which was uh, a judgment of Judge Berner all to do with an information notice and they said well that doesn't bind us and it's, it's a different case and there are reasons why it may be defective in my respectful submission about that, um, the, 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 it, it's the same as any other penalty. Um, the taxpayer has room to say, I've got a reasonable excuse not to comply with an information notice. And the tribunal will ask, is it a good enough reason, yes or no? If it's not good enough, you get a penalty. Uh, to say that um, there can never be a penalty for not complying until it's um, uh, been determined, I think is putting it too high. But I, I don't need to develop that. Um, and then they address uh, the, uh, the landed Mr Ripley's submission that a right to litigate can't itself provide a reasonable excuse. I respectfully adopt that. And then the heart of the decision, uh, 148 through to 151. Um, they're saying we don't know. That's the big. That's the big message. Grounds three and four, you'll see at 154, that's where 1182 pops up. That's not before this court. The stop it popped up. And then at uh, 157 through two, 165, they deal with interim relief. And then they remake the decision from 166 onward. So this is the actual decision that this court is, 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 is interrogating. So this is the act, the, 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 this is what they've actually decided. And they're saying, well, there are all sorts of external facts at 167, but there isn't any evidence. And that's why 168 merely pursuing JR isn't enough. And they recognised that Mr Justice Jay had said pay the tax, not in the order, but on the face of the very judgment. Whatever you think about the judgment. And then they're saying, well, in any event, after 30th November 2017, all you were doing was exercising rights of appeal. That's to litigate. That's not good enough. And then at 171, this is at stage three, so we're not talking about evidence or causation. We're saying, well, 
but it goes to one side, um, would a reasonable taxpayer have not paid their tax? And it's when knowing what you knew, Mr. Archer, and the advice that you gave, no. Uh, and to be clear, uh, because there, there's criticisms made by Mr. Archer about the, um, the approach of the other tribunal, the decision is what I've just shown you. Mm. Everything else is discussion leading up to that decision. And then, uh, behind tab 11, uh, is <coughs> this is the, 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 the um, mm -hmm. first year, uh, the first year tribunal's decision. And again, uh, with your permission, I'm, I'm going to take this very short. Uh, at paragraph 119 at page 153. First year tribunal talks about the evidential problem. There's no, no evidence from Mr. Archer. And just to be clear before we get in, or picking up the point about access to justice, it's not that the taxpayer didn't have an opportunity to lead Mr. Archer. They could have. And then the revenue would have had no complaints if they cross examined and, and the evidence they didn't like came out. Um, Mr. McDonald, uh, the learned Mr. McDonald at 120 wanted to rely on the witness evidence, the witness statement, which you briefly referred to. It. You'll see this in paragraph 120. Well, no, you can't look at that. Um, as much help says the first year tribunal at 120 and 121. And at one, uh, 135, right at the bottom of page 154, you'll see, well, the question about the decision, they can't, they, um, they simply can't make findings of fact. And picking up the point raised by my lady, Lady Justice Whipple, about was the question of causation, but why? Why was the tax not paid? That, that ad, uh, is addressed. It's at paragraph 130 and 131 at page 155. They're saying, well, look, if you look at these court documents, um, there, there is a problem. 129 talks about the evidential hole, but there is a problem. Um, because Amongst other things, Mr. Justice Jay said pay up. But it's the sentence, it's the, it's the last sentence. There is no other evidence to fill the evidential gap as to why payment was not made. So that addresses squarely, to be fair to the FTT, the question of what was the reason for the non payment? Why? Call it causation, if you like. And then 131. Mr. Archer has not provided evidence or belief or understanding. So it's not just belief. Sometimes belief is not the right word. And with your permission, I'll, I'll leave the FTT decision at, at that. But I did want to show you. And as I say, we've got the documents that, that the court has asked for. I'll give you those. Um, but what I wanted to show you was that the FTT... Um, uh, they were found to have made these these errors, which the, um, the the upper tribunal corrected, but they did address the question of why did you not pay the tax? They've um, shown you, and they're saying we can't we can't make these findings. So in my respect for submission, uh, we've got a world in which, for every single one of the reasonable excuses, and indeed. Um, as articulated uh, 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 by, by the court um, when it comes to the, the JR being nuggetry, well, we're talking about the risk of it being nuggetry. No evidence that that is what the underlying reason for not paying the tax was. And saying it doesn't make it so. 
in a world in which the onus is on the taxpayer. And for the reasons I've delivered, even if that evidence had been provided, the right to run a JR, the submission that it, uh, uh, it, it was going to be made nuggetary if he paid the tax, um, the uh, defects in the closure notice, the interim orders, uh, the um, taxpayers' um, uh, self-assessment online, none of those amount to a reasonable excuse for the reasons I've given and the reasons that the, the, the other tribunal um, addressed. And just to pick up one very last point, if, and I don't, uh, Gregory says he doesn't, but if Mr. Um, Archer did have a reasonable excuse, it ended on the 30th of November. After that, he was exercising rights of appeal and nothing more. So the, um, the delay was not reasonable. Uh, those are my submissions. Can I clar just clarify one point? I'm sure you've covered it, but I just want to make sure that I've got it noted down. And it's um, this point, that for much of the period in question, there was interim relief granted by the admin court, the court of appeal, or agreed with HMRC. So in the, in the civil proceedings, you had that protection. And the point of that was that that was the court saying to HMRC, prohibiting HMRC from um, enforcing the closure notices and from suing on the debt um, with the, I accept a bankruptcy background that's what the courts were saying and it's, I have found it difficult and I just want your answer on this point to reconcile what I think your primary submission is which is that um, the thing that this taxpayer ought to have done which he didn't do was to pay the very tax. Those things sit, it seems to me, uncomfortably together. You have one court saying you can't enforce it, HMRC, with a proposition now advanced in front of this court that um, the reasonable and right thing to do was to pay the tax in question. Uh, the way I would, uh, please may I respond like this. Um, Mr. Archer um, says, well, I've got the money, um, but I'm not paying it. Um, and uh, be because I think the closure notices are, 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 are defective. He then says, well, because it's specifically bankruptcy, mm. specifically bankruptcy, that's going to ruin my reputation. That is in his witness statement. It's all going to be problematic, and there's loans from Coots, and they might um, pull these loans, all that. That's why I'm saying, in these particular um, bankruptcy, I've got the money. He, he, he said that more than once. Um, but in these particular bankruptcy proceedings, he is saying, at, at, at the specific dates that he made this, these applications for interim relief, stop them from enforcing the debt. This is going to give me a problem. So the, what, the, the, the rationale of, these, uh, of, of all of these orders in the course of bankruptcy proceedings was that they found uh, that um, Mr. Archer was uh, entitled, even though he was saying he had the money, because it was bankruptcy proceedings, uh, to be protected from the revenue pursuing the debt. It is a different question, a completely different question, given that this case is a bit of the money, at least at two points, at the beginning and uh, at the time of the interim order, and um, he paid um, on the 22nd of June, so nine days after the um, Supreme Court gave its, uh, its permission. It's a, it's, a, it's a different question to say, did he have a good enough reason not to pay that tax in the first place as at 4th March? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much, Mr. Ghosh. Very clear. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, I forgot. Uh, there's a case. And there's nothing like a case. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's not in the bundle, because typically Mr. Ripley has found it. Um, uh, and uh, it's a case called um, Palm View Estates Limited and Thurrock, 2021, 
Court of Appeal, page 1871, uh, which looks at analogous provisions, not these ones, but absolutely, as my lady, Lady Justice Falk had said, accepts that the statutory context of penalty provisions are critical in how you how you define it. Um, uh, um, it's not in the bundle. I'm simply drawing it to the court's attention. I, I'm ashamed I didn't know about this case. But anyway, Mr. Ripley's told me about it now. Um, and Thomas please. states against Thurrock. Uh, 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 T-H-U-R-R-O-C-K. Yeah, yeah. Have you got the full citation? Uh, yes, my lady. It's um, 2021. Yeah. Uh, Court of Appeal, neutral citation, page 1871. The EWCA. EWCA Civ. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, 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 I've said and made clear we'll get, we'll get the courts, um, the, the, we'll get the court the documents that yes. the Ms. Brown, um, just to give us an idea, how long do you think you'll be in reply? I'll aid, finish by one. Very good. Thank you very much. But in finishing by one, it might all be a little bit haphazard and random in terms of order, um, for which um, obviously I apologise, but... No I need to apologise. That's how it's going to happen. Um, I think the starting position, unfortunately, is however much you wish to dodge this, you can't do it. Um, this is not an APME. And Mr. Ghosh has repeatedly said that we are in a situation in which the statutory context is relevant. And in the statutory context of Section 59, you need to bring in Section 55, and you need to bring in the fact APN case, but it's not an APN case because HMRC did not confirm the, um, the um, APN following the representations. Now, the upper tribunal almost records all of my submission on this, but what it misses out um, is that there is, it's very critical that section 220, um, subsection 2B, of, um, in relation to APNs. This is te uh, removing the possibility of postponement. No. It's, it's, so section 220 yeah. um, is in relation to, sorry, I, I'll backtrack slightly. So Mr. Um, Mr. Ghosh has contended that in these proceedings, the default position is that HMRC should have been holding the tax, not the taxpayer. Yes. So we, but we know that the default position depends on whether there's postponement in the context of an appeal. Now, Section 558C. Before you get, just before you get into that, I just want to check. Do you agree that statutory, the statutory regime or the context is a relevant consideration, but you say it's not APN, or are you saying it's not even relevant at all? I say it's a relevant consideration. It is. Everything yeah. is a relevant okay. consideration. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't be relevant. If, if, so it's, it's, it's a circumstance. It's part of the circumstances it's part of the when you're looking at objective reasonableness. Absolutely. Right. Okay. So Section 558B. So Section 558C. C, sorry. Um, little a provides that there shall be no postponement to which the payment specified in the notice under Section 220 2B of the Act relates. So if we can look at 220 2B which is on page 45 of the authorities bundle. We see that the notice must specify the payment, if any, 
required to be made under section 223, and these are the critical words, and the requirements of that section. We then go to section 223, which is on page 49. Yep. 2232 requires the recipient of the notice to make a payment, um, and 3 treats the payment as a payment on account. Subsection 4 requires the payment to be made within the required period, and the required period is defined in subsection 5. Mm -hmm. And that's 90 days, or if you make representations, 30 days afterwards. Thus, in the case of representations having been given, the payment required to be made under section 220, subsection 2b, is the sum which becomes payable no later than 30 days after the APN has been determined. So if you follow 55 through, you get to the end of 30 days. Postponement, it's an, the relating is relating to a confirmed APN, not an issued APN, a confirmed APN. But if, you'd, if you had appealed to the FTT, isn't the argument that HMRC would, in, would then have responded to the representations and that would have crystallised the APN? They might have done. They could have done that yeah. at any point, yeah. as my Lady Lady Justice Whisper said yesterday. Yeah. You could have confirmed these at any point, couldn't you? Yeah. Yes. Did you? No. Why didn't you? Nobody knows. Yeah. Literally nobody knows. Yeah. So the relevant circumstance here is that we had no confirmed APN, and with no confirmed APN, we are not in a regime where the default position is HMRC hold the money. We're well, in. You're in. You're in a. Uh, HMRC don't hold the money until after the FTT appeal. Provided subject that to the they then issue then they then um, issue the request for payment. Yeah. So that's my first um, big. Um, the second one, um, in fact, I've no idea what order, how important the rest <laughs> of them are. It's, the second one is pursuant to section 59C, we know that there must be a reasonable excuse throughout the period. There's no requirement that it needs to be the same reasonable excuse. It could be a whole series of tessellated reasonable excuses. We know that the review officer thought that exercising a right of appeal was something that was a um, reasonable excuse. Exercising his right of judicial review was a reasonable excuse. And his uh, reasonable thing to do wasn't a reasonable appeal. thing to do. Um, thank you for correcting me, my lady. Mr. Ghosh stopped short of saying that it was unreasonable to follow something through on an appeal. He very carefully said, We've got interim relief, then we've got exercising a right of appeal, then we've got interim relief, then we've got exercising a right of appeal. In mix in with which was an agreement. But at no point did he acknowledge that if you stitched all of those together, they do cover beginning to end. The whole period, there's no point in that period where there's actually a gap. I don't think that was his point. His point was they don't amount to a reasonable excuse. Of, of course, he says they don't amount to a reasonable excuse, and we say they do amount to a reasonable yes. excuse. But it's provided that exercising a right of appeal is a reasonable excuse, there is no gap. On the question of um, 
paragraph 43 of the Court of Appeal judgment, um, it was said yesterday there's no jurisdiction of the FTT in bankrupt collateral bankruptcy proceedings, of course there was not. But there was no jurisdiction of the FTT at all in relation to the um, non-amendment in the closure notice. There was unquestionably a, um, jurisdiction in relation to the conclusions. But Mr. Archer did not challenge the conclusions. There is also a right of appeal in connection with an amendment. But if there isn't an amendment, and this was the Woolwich point I made yesterday, you presuppose the answer, but there's no jurisdiction. If you don't want to appeal the conclusion and you haven't got an amendment, there's no jurisdiction under Section 31. So the tribunal did not have jurisdiction to determine this. Now, that is different, um, picking up um, on my lady, lady Justice Hulk's um, point yesterday, to an out-of-time discovery assessment. There is an assessment, but there's something that you say that's wrong with it. Here... Yeah, I, of course, there's specific provision for appeals for the right where challenge for the discovery assessment would be by way of appeal, but Pre I think I'd take your point. Precisely. So we're, we're in a different place. It doesn't matter where the dispute is being litigated whether it's being litigated in the administrative court or in the FTT, does that make a difference? Well, my learned friend says yes. I think he says Be no. Because if you're litigating it in the... Well, I'm not clear what he's saying, actually. Um, if you're litigating it in the Judicial Review Court and you're in a regime where you would have had to have paid, the default position is payment, then you can't have a reasonable excuse for non-payment by litigating you. Um, but if you are not in, an, in a situation where the default is that HMRC are holding the tax, then if the default position is that HMRC don't hold the tax and there is no penalty, let's remember that if you're in a postponement situation, you are outside the surcharge regime, completely outside of it. It's not that that gives you a reasonable excuse. You're outside the regime. Now, there isn't an equivalent position, but why would it be the case that you can't make a reasonable excuse in that situation where the alternative route is that you're outside the regime altogether? No risk at all of being penalised. Subject to a surcharge is not a risk, I think. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I've quite got that. <laughs> I'm sure it's me. No, Can I start at the beginning, yes. which is just to make sure I've got on board uh, your submission, and I think it echoes what you said yesterday, that there was no jurisdiction in the FTT. And you counter, so the point was made that, of course, the FTT considered, considered Section 114, but you, your client had chosen to go on JR. And there's a legal dispute, doubtless, between you on jurisdiction, because you say that your exclusive remedy or bankruptcy court, or but bankruptcy. not the FTT. Yeah. But not the FTT. They couldn't do anything about this defective, as we know it was, closure notice. That, that is said. my submission, yes. yes. Or let's put it another way, that the FTT would not be able to assist Mr Archer um, because he wouldn't have a basis of challenge. If you like, a challenge to the amendment to the amendment presupposes there's an amendment corrected under section 114 and he wasn't challenging the conclusion which was the other thing he wasn't challenging. I think the critical part of what my lady has just said is the um, and he didn't appeal the conclusion. So what I would say is there was no jurisdiction in relation to the amendment because there wasn't on the face of it an amendment. There was jurisdiction in relation to and seized of that jurisdiction, it could have or must have addressed the under um, the under assessment point. 
that yes, he was but fully he was not entitled. Complaining. Yeah, he wasn't complaining about. He the wasn't conclusions. complaining about. He was fully entitled to go to the admin court and challenge the legality, lawfulness, validity of that closure process, and that isn't something he could have done in the way that he did. Precisely. Um, I'm really not sure I understand the. Um, this is all part of this, also part of the scheme of the tax submission. That section 59C11 um, in in some way would be undermined um, if there was a reasonable excuse in this case. Section 55C11 applies where a surcharge applies and HMRC choose to mitigate it. And if you've got a reasonable excuse, the surcharge doesn't apply, so you never get to um, you never get to 11 because it. it it's taken out. Mr. Justice Jay's judgment um, and order say he must pay up. But with all due respect to Mr. Justice Jay, he's not capable of establishing an enforceable debt. He decided that there wasn't an enforceable debt. He thought that they should he should that Mr. Um, Archer should make payment. But on what basis should he make payment when there's no enforceable debt? This wasn't a case of a judgment debt. Mr. Um, Justice Jay was expressing a view. But you, you, you don't rely on any evidence of what Mr. Archer was advised or was thinking. And you say it's blindingly obvious at points when the courts say he's got a good arguable case and we're going to give him interim relief, that that is what he's acting on. But at a point where Mr Justice Jay says pay up, and at a point where the Court of Appeals say, you, this is totally technical, form over substance, um, dismiss the case, it, it can't be blindingly obvious. And so then there's then, there is a gap, isn't there? I mean, you can't have it both ways. And I am not asking to have it both ways. Right. I am saying that the court should take all but, of But this. at the point where Mr Justice Jay says, pay up, we've, we've got nothing to tell us what, what it was Mr Archer was thinking. Was he thinking Mr Justice Jay had taken leave of his senses, or what was he thinking? He exercised his right of appeal. That's what, that's what Ms. yesterday I said, that Mr Archer had to do something. And what he did, we know what he did. And yes. you say that's enough. And we oh, say that. It's objectively reasonable to exercise a right of appeal. It doesn't matter what he thought about the merits. That is what I argue. Okay. Um, gross and obvious error. Um, my learned friend said, if you got a um, surcharge notice that said you owe £100 million and you believe that you owed one because somebody put a decimal point in the wrong way, you would have an obvious um, reasonable excuse for not paying the hundred because you knew that it was one. If we flip that on its head and you got one that said you owe one million and you knew that you would probably owe a hundred million and you actually paid the amount with the pound note to HMRC's bank account in precisely, would you then have a reasonable excuse for not paying the other 99 million? Well, it would be quite hard for HMRC to say, well, you should have paid me more. I told you what you owed. Look at that document, or look at this document with that document. It was obvious we made a mistake. We would submit that it's highly unlikely that a court if you actually got a demand saying you need to pay a million and you paid a million, to then be penalised for not paying a number that was bigger than a million. But where's the difference here? We didn't have a pound note 0 0.00. Or we didn't if you looked at closure notices, but we did. But the courts found expressly that you knew exactly what uh, was payable and you weren't challenging the assessment or the liability. Sorry. We weren't challenging the liability. Sorry, I'm sorry, not the assessment. 
You were challenging um, the absence of an assessment. And we knew what the co we knew what was found was that we knew the what the consequence of the conclusion was. Yeah. So you were so taking a technical point. Yes, that's liability, not yeah. collection. Yes. Um, causation. If there is a roadblock, I cannot drive down the road. On some days, I might not drive down that road because I think that there's a traffic jam there. So I'll take, a di take the diversion, a diversion that I determine. But on the day that it's blocked, I can't go that way. In fact, that sometimes I might go another way doesn't stop me from saying, today, I can't go that way. And that's but he never did say it. He did. Well, he didn't. He pleaded he, his case. He pleaded a case. He pleaded a case. That said, I've got a dispute. But he never said, there's a roadblock and I can't go down it. Well, he certainly did say that really? before the Supreme Court. Um, and the revenue responded and said, pay and we will pay it back. Well, no. And it's very interesting that Mr. Ghosh didn't. You, you, my lady, asked him, where had they said that? And he said, I don't know. Well, they didn't. But they said it on the 17th of December. No, they said they had said it. And they had not. If you look at their letters. So are you saying that that was not said in good faith? I'm saying it was said as a submission without foundation of fact. I would not say. You were given a little shopping list of letters. Where in any of those letters did it say, but you I, pay up and we'll I'm sorry, I, I understand your point that they may not, you're saying you, you don't know where they said it before, but they're saying it in that document. Or are you saying that that was not in good faith and that that was not something that could be relied on? I'm saying that there was a serious risk of in relying on it, and the reason that there was a serious risk of relying on it is it would not necessarily have given rise to a cause of action. Imagine if HMRC, on the basis of this is following on from the point I made yesterday, there's a liability, and Mr. Arch has challenged collection. Um, he pays voluntarily, putting himself at Woolwich risk. HMRC repays voluntarily, following um, in in the same way as they said they could in um, in Woolwich. Except we're not in Woolwich because we're not in an unjust enrichment situation. What would the Public Accounts Committee have said? HMRC, if they had collected, even voluntarily, 22 or 24 million pounds, and then repaid it voluntarily against a liability that was not disputed. There must have been a serious risk that Woolwich, irrespective of what um, Mr. Um, HMRC has put in their notice of objection, but also that was a notice that was a notice of objection for, for interim relief in the event that permission was granted. So that was a prospective point. They'd already granted interim relief through the solicitor's agreement. So that document was talking about something yet to come, not something that was extant. Mm -hmm. And that yet to come never happened. In terms of um, inability to pay, Mr. Archer wasn't unable to pay. It's quite plain to everybody that he had this £22 million. You don't 
creates twenty-two million pounds that you've got on day one, you pay it two years later. It's quite obvious that he had that money. He had given evidence to, to um, Mr. Justice Kerr that was also referenced in Mr. Um, in the tribunal. I'm sorry, in the admin document, in which he stated he had substantial assets that he was willing to pay if there was a debt. There is no evidence at all that would contradict that information. Well, so you're saying we should draw an inference? I'm saying it's blinding the obvious. Blinding the obvious that he had the money available to pay to the revenue at any moment throughout the period. It, the question is, did he have an inability no. to pay? No, no. You're saying he had the ability to pay? Yes. Right. The ability to pay at any moment available funds ready uh, and, and and there. He has the ability to pay. No, I'm, we, you're asking us to infer that he had, at any point in the whole of that period, he had the ability to pay that money, um, that it was available to be paid. The provision of section 59C says, that the inability to pay may not be a reasonable excuse. Yeah. At no point did he say that he didn't have an ability to pay. No. At the start, he said he did. And at the end, he proved that he did. Yes. But so my, with respect, I would say that my lady's question to me is not the right question. It's, is, did he... Is there any part of his case that he did not have the ability to pay? Well, that's not no. his case. But what you, um, by not going into the witness box and giving evidence, nobody could explore whether there were some other reasons operating um, uh, on his mind and whether he was, instead of um, paying up, taking the risk because he calculated that the risk was a risk worth taking. I repeat my submission from yesterday on that that assumes a presumption of inability to pay, which we say is wrong. In the upper tribunal, um, your submission was that there was no need in a case like this for any evidence of why the taxpayer uh, didn't pay. All you needed to do is go to the third stage and look at whether it was objective, objectively reasonable by reference to all the documents in the case for the taxpayer to rely on the judicial review risk and the interim relief and the um, point exercising point rights point. of appeal. Is that, that's your case still? Yes. Yeah. Um, so my final point is, um, and by way of example, um, for um, the court to note, um, supplementary 29, page 156, throughout the period there was correspondence in which it was absolutely clear what Mr Archer was doing and why he was doing it. Um, including right at the start of his witness statement, I will pay if there is a debt established to be a debt. And he did that. And that was reiterated at each stage. It is clear on the face of that evidence 
why he was doing what he was doing and why he was not also begging. So what this case comes down to is whether, given HMRC's mistake that was remediated by Section 114, it is nevertheless reasonable that through the course of that process, Mr Archer did not pay. And if it is reasonable, he should not have to pay a further £1.3 million in surcharge. He's paid all the interest. Yeah. Um, if it was not reasonable, he will lose. But if it was reasonable in all of the circumstances, he should succeed. And unless further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, right on time. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Thank you both very much, and to those sitting immediately behind you, and I know that there are teams behind them um, who have put in a lot of work. Uh, this has been a very well-argued um, and well-presented case, and we're very grateful for that. It won't surprise you to know that we will be reserving our judgments. Uh, when those uh, judgments are ready, they will be circulated for uh, typographical errors, uh, not for further uh, submissions on the substantive points, and we would hope that you would be able to agree a, um, a, a consequential order, uh, but if not, uh, we will expect written submissions in relation to that. Can I remind you uh, of the uh, warning in relation to um, uh, circulating the draft and the contempt of court provisions as recently emphasised by the uh, MR. I'm sure you're all aware of it, but I am required to remind you. So, um, can we do it? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my lady helpfully um, said, do you, do you want to respond to the palm you Thurrock case. I don't know what it says. Um, Mr. McDonnell. Um, sorry. Um, you, you, why don't you speak to Mr. McDonnell for a moment? Mr. Ghosh, when did you say you would give us those documents? We, did, we missed it. I think it was 2.30. Uh, 2.30. Two, two, two two Thank you very much. Um, could you, I think there might have gone something wrong with the email contact for me. Um, if somebody could just... Oh, I well, 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 I can always get it off one yes. of my colleagues. Can't <laughs> I? No, I've, uh, We'll, we'll get it right. Thank, uh, you. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll get it right. I, I, I'm just wondering how we'll get it. Uh, can you please? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll make sure it reaches all three, all, all three of the courts. If you want to pass me up a, a need, well, I I'll leave get, it for we'll the others. Yeah. I can get my clerk. Okay, thanks. Um, so, Miss McDonnell has skim read it. Yes. Um, we don't think that there's anything particularly important in it, um, but we would invite the tribunal to read paragraph 30, sorry, the court to read paragraph 31. It says, um, there's no definition of reasonable dispute in the 2004 Act. However, it seems um, to me that the plain meaning of the words used in the subsection as a whole and taken in context is that there is a defence here to use objectively. There's a reasonable dispute in having control of, our, of or managing an HMO without a licence. It seems to me that it is obvious, therefore, that reasonable dispute must relate to actively controlling or managing an HMO. But it doesn't appear to add anything. That was paragraph 31. 31. Thank you. Um, but obviously, I didn't know about it until actually after Mr. Ghosh had sat down, because he sat down and stood up again. Um, if, if the court were to think it was of huge importance, then I would, I particularly would be giving well, let me put it. Let me put the onus on you, Miss Brown. Um, if you, having reflected over lunch, um, think it is of huge importance, can you just just a few bullet points send us your bullet points this afternoon? 
I think it is extraordinarily unlikely. unlikely. Well, that's what I thought, um, but <laughs> I'd rather have the onus on you than on us. Very well, I Thank you. take the onus. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'm grateful. Anything else? Thank you all. All right.